I don't think that you can invest too much of yourself. Like it's spending actual time with people, being vulnerable, letting them know what matters to you. And, and in those aspects, I, I think I've been decently good at building those kinds of relationships. Frankly, what I wasn't very good at is I, I do have a high level of trust and maybe sometimes I should have given up on a few lost causes. Um, it, it kind of bothers me even to say that, but there are some people who will never be persuaded. Um, and it, it may be better to spend more time with the people who are your, your allies. I was always trying to convince the unconvinced. I, I'll never forget one time we were doing the Webster Groves fourth of july parade and it's a big parade it's a five mile route it's jammed just about the whole way and people a couple of people yelled out some pretty critical things for me and i stopped and was like debating them until my husband said no we're you're like yeah thank you very much happy fourth of july let's move on but like i just i wanted to persuade everyone you won't ever persuade everyone you're not going to please everybody all the time so i do think it's important to really invest in the relationships that that matter the people who are going to be there for you when you're there for them i'm so excited to release this episode with katherine hannaway she's the first and only woman to ever be the speaker of the missouri house of representatives she's an accomplished attorney and prosecutor She's a wife, a mother, a leader, and has a deep, deep faith. Also, she was the first Republican in a generation to lead her party into the majority in the state legislature in the early 2000s, a majority that has remained to this day. She's, ins she's an inspiring and effective leader, and this is one of the best interviews I've ever had the pleasure to record. Enjoy. So glad to have Catherine Hannaway with me here. I just love that you took time to spend time with me. Catherine, thanks for joining me today. Well, Travis, you know, you have always been uh, one of the people I really admired who was willing to step up and devote some time to, and not just time, but you, uh, devote of yourself to the leadership of the state. And uh, that's when our state really uh, is in good hands is when people mm -hmm. take some time away from the private sector to, to come and to give the best of their ideas, energy and talent to serving each other. So kind of you. And I want to start with this, this story. Uh, the, one of my first really substantive interactions with, with you was when you were running for governor. And I was the MC for the Lincoln Day dinner in Calhoun County, which is a district I represented as a representative. I was really young in my house career. And we were, I was the MC and there were other candidates running for governor who demanded to talk before you. And I walked up to you because we had an order and I think you were in the front of that order. And I said, Hey, I'm, I'm just getting a lot of pressure here. Um, trying to make everybody be happy. And she said, go ahead, let her, let, let this other person speak. And they were being real, um, you know, pretty annoying about it. And you were just, you were just terrific about just saying, Hey, let them speak. I'll, I'll get my moment. And, and uh, can you speak to wh where does that humility come from? And, that leadership capacity. Well, humility to me is like, that's about the nicest thing you could have said to me because look, I'm, I'm a per person of faith. My faith is very important to me. I, I don't understand people who don't have a faith, who believe that human beings are the highest power in the universe. I think it's a sort of hubris to think, you know, that there's, there, there's no power, no glory above us. And so my faith tradition teaches me that humility is important and that real leadership is servant leadership, that we um, as leaders are, are meant to take care of people and to look out for them and to be of service to them. And that's what I've always tried to do. I, I am sure I have had my prima donna moments, um, <laughs> which it sounds like one of the other candidates might have been having that night. I, I, I'm confident that I have failed in that regard. So anytime that I can um, c truly live up to what I hope to do and be humble, that's a good thing. 
Where did you learn that? Where did that come from for you? You know, great, great parents and grandparents who really taught me to to be grateful for every opportunity in life. One, I'll just share one family folklore story, but it's it's absolutely true. My great grandmother lost her legs in a cooking fire that happened before my grandmother was born. So after my grandmother was born and she grew up on a farm in central Nebraska in, in really, you know, tough times, her mother still had her legs, but they were burned terribly. And over the course of a couple of winters had to go to the Mayo Clinic to have them amputated. So my grandmother had a, a view of life of just how hard it could be and really infused in us to be grateful for all the blessings that we had. And that like every day was just a blessing and a miracle. And uh, it was really hard to complain to her about like, oh, you know, grandma, like I had to stay an hour after school today or, you know, I had to do some. We had we had horses when I was growing up. Oh, I had to do all the chores by myself. <laughs> Just kind of get a look like what? Yeah. You're lucky you didn't get smacked, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Well, her favorite phrase was, listen, sister. <laughs> <laughs> I love it so much that, you know, I, I feel like we all have grandparents that, that were like, just wouldn't take complaining. And that's a, that's a helpful lesson as we pass that on to our kids. And I certainly do with my, my daughters. Um, they have it so good and it's really helpful to get perspective. I really enjoyed your episode with the, the lessons you learned from your grandmother. That was terrific. It was fun to listen to. Well, thanks for listening to that. She was a special lady. You, you were in charge of a big change in Missouri politics in the early 2000s when you went from the minority leader in the state House of, Le of Representatives to the Speaker of the House in one election cycle. As you developed a plan to win, I think it was 42 seats or you played in 42 seats. And just tell me what it takes to go from a majority Democrat state for generate a generation to all the pub, all of a sudden Republican supermajorities with all those wins in a cycle. I mean, the amount of work that it takes in planning and vision and mission that it takes is just astronomical. Can you, can you tell me a little bit about that? Well, we did work really hard at that. Um, I will also say uh, that I was in the right place at the right time. Term limits came in for the first time in full force and effect, and we had redistricting. And I really do think the outcome of that election was just a reflection of um, who who Missourians really were. Um, you know, we still had conservative Democrats in the General Assembly then. Um, I actually uh, have spent today, this morning, talking to some civic leaders in the St. Louis area who are, are contemplating putting on the ballot uh, a requirement again to have a permit to carry concealed. And, and one of those leaders said, well, gee, in 1999, which, you know, it's ancient, truly ancient history in our electoral <laughs> politics in Missouri. In 1999, when it was on the ballot, we were able to prevent, you know, concealed carry from going forward in Missouri and can't believe that we're, you know, even having an argument that people should have permits today and not have constitutional carry. And, and he literally said, what's changed? And I said, well, in 1999, we had a Democrat governor, Bill Clinton had won the last presidential election in Missouri. We had our Democrat controlled House and Senate. And when this went out on the ballot, you had the governor picking the election. You had a secretary of state writing language that was super favorable. You even had an AG who was, you know, giving it a favorable review. All of that's different now, and I think all of that is much more consistent with the values that Missourians hold. And, and we were able to sort of take advantage of the fact that Missourians were crying out in, in 2002 for elected representatives who really represented their values. But <clears throat> the point remains that you, you led this incredible work to 
change the nature of politics in Missouri for the foreseeable future. I mean, I'm, I'm a beneficiary to some extent. I mean, you, you know, when you look at the Missouri Senate, maybe you say, maybe you're not a beneficiary at, at this moment with <laughs> some of the, <laughs> some of the flaws we have in the system right now. But um, just having Republican majorities in the state of Missouri, in large part because of the foundation you laid at that time. And I just think there's a lot of leadership lessons in the work that it took you to, t- one, target 42 districts, two, find candidates that were good for those districts, three, keep track of those districts, raise the funds for those districts, be the point. You always have to have a point person. You can't have 50 chiefs and do well. Like there's there's a lot to that. Elected politics is not easy. Well, I will say I learned a great deal working for former Senator Kit Bond, working on President Bush's election in 2000. Um, it was super helpful. Like I had worked with Carl Rove as a mail vendor, like before he became the Carl Rove, we we all know. And we did. Um, we were very strategic. And I, there's a guy whose name um, I, I wish was a little better known in Missouri politics named Chuck Casely, who managed that campaign for the House Republican Campaign Committee and later was my chief of staff as speaker and now is an executive at Evergy in Kansas City. Um, he was absolutely critical to that. And one thing I will say that is is really different between then and now, and probably now is better, but because we didn't have a lot of resources, it was the the actual reps and candidates who were super, super hands-on. Um, do, I mean, we were sitting up nights writing polls. I mean, we had some professional pollsters, but we didn't have money to pay for polling in all the districts. Um, Rod Jetton would go out and stay in people's houses and try and persuade them to be candidates. Richard Byrd, who um, is no longer with us, was just like absolutely a brainiac on what the policy issues should be. And um, it, it was just a little more homemade and it had a lot a lot of heart in it. And now everything is very professionalized. Lots of consultants get paid. Um, there's a lot of good aspects to that. I do think that that, that sort of warmth and passion and it being really personal maybe is missing a little bit from how campaigns get run today. Honestly, and I, I don't want to insert myself too much, but my, my really competitive primary last year, I feel like that was the difference for us where we nobody thought we could win. I think our personal nature and vision and mission that we spoke about from the heart constantly really was the, besides being blessed by the Lord, I think the Lord was in it, but um, I, I think just really put us over the top. And that personal nature, I think, has an impact. I think you're 100% right on that. What did you learn from just that endeavor alone, like leadership lessons? Were there Were there things that you took from that that you will always remain with you? Absolutely. And first of all, I think you won your election because you were the best candidate. <laughs> and and in the end, I, th- nice. I do think very much that candidates matter. You know, we get so much s- slick polling and social media and all these other things. And voters are smart. They're a lot smarter than most people give them credit for. And, you know, when when I, after I left the legislature, I was a prosecutor federal prosecutor, tried a lot of cases. Um, Juries are smart and it's kind of, it's almost like a small voter pool and you get to see it a little bit more up close and you put on all this evidence in cases and you think, oh, they're not going to seize on the right point. And then you debrief and people really are paying much more attention often than we think they are. And that's been a leadership lesson for me, for sure, to, to, always show respect to the people that you're trying to lead and and presume that they are smart, that they are going to figure it out, um, that they're going to be able to root out any kind of, you know, sort of falsehood you're trying to pull over on them. I was trying to clean up, uh, you know, they have strong BS detectors uh, because (laughs) that's really, they do and, and they do. The other thing that I just, it's a leadership lesson I have to learn over and over again. You know, I went from being speaker and then the president appointed me to be the United States attorney. And currently I'm serving 
as chair of our law firm. Um, we're in 23 cities. We have more than a thousand lawyers, more than 2,000 total employees. It's it's a big enterprise, and the the lesson I can't learn too many times is that it's teamwork that matters. Like you have got to work with people who are smarter, more energetic, more creative, and more innovative than you are and do everything that you can do to inspire them to live up to their very best. And when that happens, magic happens. Like that's the secret sauce. No one person can really um, lead any enterprise effectively by themselves. As you lead people that you, you're surrounded by alphas, right? People that want to be out front, want to be number one, uh, whether it's a legislature, whether it's in a governor's race, whether it's leading a big law firm, very successful law firm. How do you lead people well when you're leading all these alphas that want to be in, in pole position? When I figured that out, I'll tell you. <laughs> I'll also be a lot. a whole book, a whole, whole book out of that. Uh, it, it, it is really, really tough. And, um, you know, I, it, sometimes you do really have to uh, put up sometimes with some alpha behavior and kind of just let people go a little bit. Uh, and then because you want, look, it, this is a poor analogy, but it's a true analogy. I'd much rather have like a horse that you have to run it, rein in because they're running too fast than a horse that you kind of have to hit with the stick to make sure that they speed up. So having alphas that want to take ownership and take responsibility is it, it, it's critical to having a successful team, right? You, you, you need Michael Jordan and Scottie Pippen. And whatever the crazy guy's name was, who, uh, you know, Dennis Rodman, Dennis Rodman, you need them all. And they're all alphas in different ways, right? To win championships. And, you know, maybe today uh, there's a more updated basketball analogy, but I'm not going to torture you through it. Well, you know, I'm real, real tempted to to shift this to North Korea and Dennis Rodman's love affair with North Korea, but I'll try to keep, I'll try to stay away from that. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was after the basketball career. Yeah. Yeah. That's a very interesting human being, but that's neither here nor there. You have this interest, just incredible leadership qualities about you. I think some people would look at you and say, wow, she's really intimidating because you have a presence. You're, you don't take, you don't take, um, a lot of crap, you know, you're, you kind of this person that just comes in and says, Hey, there's a job to be done. I'm going to do the job. That's intimidating for some, some people even say, um, that they're, you just, the fact that you're intimidating figure is, is, is hard to like approach. But I think the fear doesn't come from the fact that you're just an intimidating figure. It's, it's because you've been effective. And I, I read this in an article that you were feared for being effective. And I think that's a tremendous thing to be here for. Uh, how do you, how, how do you build a, the qualities that make you as effective as you've been in your, in your career? Well, I have mellowed with age, Travis. I will <laughs> say that. Well, I've, I don't know that we need a mellow Catherine Hanaway. We need, we need yeah. fire and brimstone Catherine Hanaway. You know, um, <laughs> I have learned some lessons. Like I will say when I was minority leader in particular, like I was in my late thirties and I was just absolutely breathing fire in every direction. And I have learned that, you know, you really can get people to, to perform even better when they feel encouraged and have a positive attitude that they're met with. Um, in terms of being effective, I, I, I think, establishing that level of trust with your team where they know you've got their back. And, and even when I was breathing fire, I, I, I think, you know, the, the, the people on the leadership team knew that we, we were in it together. That's the thing I miss the most as I look mm -hmm. at the Missouri general assembly today is, is that I don't feel that sense that Republicans really have each other's backs in the way that they did then. And I know it's because the majorities are so much bigger and that's a good thing, but that means it's a big tent and you have lots of different opinions in it. Um, I, 
I do think it's important that we remember that the people who, um, you know, we're trying to win elections against have D's after their names. And, and it, it, it's almost irrelevant in Missouri General Assembly races anymore, but it will come back around as all things do. And I, I, I'd sure like to see us collectively as a party stand up for each other a little bit more. This is a, like a great segue into advice for me as a state senator. But, you know, as you see these infighting, some infighting, and you give this great advice on how you lead, you know, it's not always fire and brimstone that's needed. Uh, often, actually, right now, we just need people that are going to sit down and build trust. What would you say for a senator, you know, a young senator like me that's going into the situation you that you, I'm sure, you're very aware of in the state Senate that wants to build trust with Republican colleagues, knowing we have a supermajority and we have this mandate to get things done? What would your advice be to, to actually do that and help bridge the gap between these factions in our party? Yeah, so that's a super great question and and maybe something that I have learned over time. Um, on In terms of building relationships, I don't think that you can invest too much of yourself. Like it's, spending actual time with people, being vulnerable, letting them know what matters to you. And, and in those aspects... I think I've been decently good at building those kinds of relationships. Frankly, what I wasn't very good at is I, I do have a high level of trust and maybe sometimes I should have given up on a few lost causes. Um, it, it kind of bothers me even to say that, but there are some people who will never be persuaded um, and it, it may be better to spend more time with the people who are your your allies. I was always trying to convince the unconvinced. I, I'll never forget one time we were doing the Webster Groves Fourth of July parade, and it's a big parade. It's a five mile route. It's jammed just about the whole way, and people, a couple of people, yelled out some pretty critical things of me, and I stopped and was like debating them until my husband said, "No, we're you like." Yeah, thank you very much. Happy Fourth of July. Let's move on. But like, I just, I wanted to persuade everyone. You won't ever persuade everyone. You're not going to please everybody all the time. So I do think it's important to really invest in the relationships that that matter, the people who are going to be there for you when you're there for them. That's so good. I, I would say that's probably a feature of, of my personality as well. Just really, just highly relational. And even the the people that most people have written off, it's hard to it's hard to not want to just be in their ear and say, "Hey, let's think of a different direction." And there's there's time for that, even when I think they're written off. But well, that's, and that's great advice. It's great thoughts. I like. I think that comes from the fact that both of us are Christians, right? <laughs> like we're supposed to love our fellow man. We're supposed to see the Jesus in everyone. I mean. It, you know, that's apparently what Mother Teresa would say when she would greet people is may the Christ in me meet the Christ in you. And that's really what, I, you know, I hope for. Um, and even if I'm going to disagree with somebody on a policy level, I, I really do want to find the humanity in them. And so um, I, I hate using phrases like, you know, write, write them off. Cause I never want to do that with another creature of God. Right. Sure. And this is, that's a good segue into this, this quote that you had in an article too, is to whom, to whom much is given from, from whom much will be expected. And I, and you also go on to say, I think that God has given me all the important, great things in life. One is to know him to his great parents and great kids and a great husband. If you get those things in life, I think you're called upon to make as much of it as you can. That is that's a, an incredible philosophy. And I think one that I share with you, but can you speak a little bit into that? Um, well, I definitely think you do share that philosophy from everything I, I have seen. And I, I believe that with my whole heart and soul. Like I, I believe I'm just about the luckiest person in the world. Not only do I have great parents, I do have great kids. I have a great husband but I, I got to go to great schools. I had great teachers. I had great coaches. I have 
great colleagues, all of whom inspire me. And most days, I don't think I'm nearly as, as talented as they are. And so what I can bring to the table is a, a bunch of effort. And and I say that with all humility. I, I also think God gave me a good brain and a good voice and lots of things. Um, and I, I, I'll just spend an extra minute here. Our son, we adopted from Belarus when he was 17 months old. We don't know a lot about his background, but he probably had fetal alcohol syndrome. Until he came into our life, I really thought if you just worked as hard as you could, everybody could get to the same level of results. And his hand in life is just, it's its different than yours and mine. And it, it's not immediately evident when you meet him. It's just that he's got to try harder and he's not going to get all the way there on even some, you know, some relatively basic stuff. But he's also going to go further and and be better at things like love and heart and passion and caring than anybody else I know. And. He really has taught me a great deal about what it means to to have the those gifts from God and that you should make the very most you can out of all of them. That's <clears throat> that's beautiful. It's really interesting you bring that up because I wanted to I wanted to talk about foster care for just a second with you because I know when you came in you had some real thoughts when you came in as a speaker, you had some real thoughts about the state system around foster care. Can you speak about how you how you attacked that when you became speaker and and we still have problems today. I mean, it's really bad in Missouri. My wife counsels with foster care kids and we we are just seeing problem after problem not only through the courts but in the system and uh it's it's heartbreaking because we're traumatizing kids, but speak to foster care and that the what you did when you came in as speaker. Well, please, first of all, thank your wife. Like that is such incredibly difficult work um, and just so easy to get completely burnt out. So thank her. That's really a great service. Um, and I also want to thank people who foster. So the problems we were seeing back then probably aren't that different from today, but I think we did fix a few things. So we had both ends of the spectrum. We had a 14-year-old girl who had been placed in the state's care and um, pr she'd pretty much been in the state's care for her entire life. She had never appeared in front of a judge who made a determination of whether that placement was right. And then at the other end of the spectrum, we had kids who should have been placed in care and weren't being moved out of their parents' homes and into the system. But then we also had a, a young man named Dominic James who died at the hands of foster parents who clearly were abusive and it, it, it shouldn't he shouldn't have been there. And so what we tried to do was to get more independent review of all those kinds of placements and to do it more quickly and hopefully to get um kids into the, the right placement for them and also to have a very strong preference for families. So maybe mom and dad are having um, real struggles and are not capable of being the home for the child, but maybe an aunt or uncle is, maybe grandpa and grandma are, and the preference wasn't previously very strong for those other family members. So um, these are these are the hardest situations. The the kids in our foster care system or the kids who are in on the cusp of being in the system, they really don't have any advocates. There's no lobby for, for kids who are in hopeless situations. Like nobody's going to pay someone to go lobby the general assembly on their behalf. And so it really seemed to me like it was um, the right thing to do for us to focus on that. And I know you guys have been focused on it. It, it still needs reform, um, but I do think we made some, some good progress back then. Yeah. A lot to, a lot of work to do, but the, it's, those problems remain today in a, in a lot of ways, just giving kids advocates and uh, it's, it's heartbreaking. Um, sorry to go into a dark spot there before we'll, we'll finish up here. Cause I know you only have a couple minutes left, but 
I just wanted to ask you really quick from your perspective, what, what is influence and how, how do you look at influence from your own perspective? Like how do you want to influence the world and what does leadership look like? And it's a pretty broad question, but I'm, I'm fascinated with influence and how people think about it. It is such an incredibly important question. And I, I think we've gotten away from sort of influence to sort of, um, almost blunt force tactics. Um, I think the kind of micro targeting and polling and social media, uh, have allowed that to happen where, you know, the people taking the most extreme positions have been able to motivate their voters to get out and, and, and vote and, and to use some scare tactics. I think the ability to actually sort of lead through influence where you're shaping um, what, what not shaping what people think, but having a real dialogue with them so that you can shape a solution to problems that really is sort of uh, of service to the greatest number of people. And I'm not slipping into any, you know, greatest good kind of dialogue here, but we don't talk to each other anymore and, and we don't try and persuade. It's all this sort of brute force. And I think as people realize that they are being manipulated by these social media platforms, um, they're going to stop and say, no, you know, I really kind of want better than that. As I said before, voters are smart and I think we're going to return to uh, uh, people really calling out for having more of a dialogue where you can um, influence each other by really sharing the truth of what's going on. And I, I don't know that that's a very good answer, but it, it's it's a it is a fervent hope on my part that we can get back to a place where we can speak to each other with civility and respect for each other's opinions. I think it goes back to the relational aspect of leadership too. For me, I just think it's a relational, you have to establish trust. And without that, you're just going to have this knifing each other all the time. And I just think that's a real problem, especially for Republican super majorities. It, you know, if you, We've got to govern and we've, we've got a lot of work to do on the relational side. And, and the rules today, I think, discourage us from doing that unless we take it upon ourselves to, to kind of lean into that. And you have done that in the past. I, I'm just so honored to have you on here and so inspired by your story and so thankful for the interactions I've had with you where I've gotten in little small moments, because we haven't spent a lot of time together, but in little small moments, I've gotten these really beautiful views of leadership that I really appreciate and will always go with me. So thank you, Catherine, so much. Well, Travis, like, thank you. And thanks for doing this. And thanks for the message of positivity that you're bringing out into the world. I do think you're a force for light and for good. And it really was a privilege to be on with you.